Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jeff here from Geosport. I think we have uh, about 33 participants registered. Uh, so we will try and get started because I think we have quite a lot to cover. Um, so just quickly, we'll say uh, a brief thank you to Trevor from the branch, or from the Gaming Grants branch, um, for joining us and for delivering the presentation. A couple housekeeping notes. I think everyone can see uh, the the PowerPoint presentation uh, on their screen. And in the right-hand corner, there is a little chat box. Uh, so if you do have questions come up along the way, you can always pose them there. Uh, we will ask that we keep most of the questions until the end, um, just for time-wise sake. So we have, um, we've allocated about an hour, and uh, we are recording it, and we will try and archive it on the Viasport uh, resources page within a couple days. So if you have uh, members of your organization that couldn't attend today uh, and you'd like them to be able to see it, we will try and do that. Um, last, last thing, if everyone can um, just mute themselves unless they're speaking, we'll reduce the feedback um, and just help everyone hear a little bit better. So. I will pass it over to Trevor now uh, to get us started, and we'll take it from there. Great. Thank you. I believe that was Jessica. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I would just uh, reiterate for everybody to, to mute your computers and your, your telephones to reduce that feedback. It was I could hear it, I guess, um, when Jessica was speaking. Um, so my name is Trevor Paul. I'm the uh, manager of community outreach with the Community Gaming Grants Branch. Um, and I put together a presentation here today. This, this presentation is available up online um, at our website. And uh, it's really designed to go through and explain exactly what uh, we are looking for in your community gaming grant application. So uh, I'm going to go through the eligibility criteria um, and uh, explain in detail what it is that we're looking for. So hopefully we provide some clarity. Uh, from that aspect. And um, as Jessica stated, um, if you could hold your questions to the end, there will be plenty of time for Q&A. Um, I anticipate the, to get through the presentation. I won't go through each slide in detail. I think it will take probably 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for question and answer. So um, just looking at the agenda, first I'm going to talk about the resources uh, that are available to you as applicants. Um, then I'm going to go through our program guidelines. So our program guidelines are available up on our website. And as I said, they explain in detail the eligibility criteria for a community gaming grant. Um, and after going through that, uh, those sections, I'll, I'll offer some tips and advice. And then we'll open it up to the floor for a question and answer. So the, the program guidelines are the most important resource uh, available to you uh, as an applicant for a community gaming grant. Um, we've made an effort uh, to, we, we updated those guidelines. So if, you, if you're familiar with the guidelines in the past, they have been updated. The guidelines are available on our website. Um, we've made an effort to make them more user friendly, um, more transparent. So, we, so we've made an effort to explain why we're asking for information when we're asking for it, um, and just um, providing formulas around the financial eligibility piece, which I'll, I'll go through. Um, but the guidelines are really important. And if you haven't read them, I encourage you to read them. If you're a first-time applicant, you definitely need to go through the guidelines before you think about applying. Uh, some other resources available are the our website. So there's plenty of information available up on our website. You can find things up there like a frequently asked questions document, um, templates for financial documents, um, an online application tutorial. So if, if you or, or your members are concerned about submitting an online application and how that looks, there is a PDF step-by-step um, -step, um, online tutorial or a tutorial of, about the online application process that you can go through. Um, there's also the branch. So I work in the Community Gaming Grants branch. Um, it's, it's a bit different than in the past in the sense that we are now a standalone branch. We used to be part of Gaming Policy and Enforcement Branch uh, within the Ministry of Finance. We're now, as I said, the Community Gaming Grants Branch within the Ministry of Community Sport and Cultural Development. Um, so you can contact uh, our analysts anytime by email using that email that's up on the slide or using that toll-free number. So we have 12 analysts, and every day one of those analysts is um, dedicated to duty line. So they are answering emails and responding to phone calls. 
Um, so you're welcome to, to connect with them and ask any questions you might have. Um, there's also myself, the Community Outreach Manager. My position is, 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 is new to the branch, so um, it was created in October, uh, and it was created primarily to be uh, a contact point for not-for-profits at the, at, the, um, at the branch. So if you have any questions or concerns about the application process or about your application in particular, you're more than welcome to contact me using that email, cggoutreach at gov.bc.ca. Uh, and I can set up a phone call or a time we could get together and meet and go through your application and answer any questions you might have. Um, there are also other organizations that we work really closely with. So there's the BC Association of Charitable Gaming, um, which is a provincial level organization. And beneath it, uh, it has a number of local level community charitable gaming associations uh, that are located throughout the province. And both this, the BCACG and the CCGAs um, receive money through the Community Gaming Grants Program to assist not-for-profits access gaming grant money. So their mandate is to help not-for-profits um, access gaming grant funds. Uh, and we work really closely with them. Uh, we've provided uh, this presentation to them and, and talked about how we would like to see it presented to improve um, consistency of messaging across the province. So um, if you're... Uh, uh, would prefer to talk to somebody from that association, you're, you're more than welcome to reach out to them and, and they can help provide advice. Um, they can also do things that I can't um, and an analyst won't be able to either, such as you know providing pre-screening uh, services of your application. Um, we just don't have time at the branch to review everybody's um, applications before submitting and, and it wouldn't be fair if we, if we provided that service for some people and not for others. So. If that's what you're, if you're looking for somebody to read over your program description or something, um, I would recommend contacting uh, the BCACG. Uh, there's also the BC Association of Aboriginal Friendship Centers, uh, who we also work very closely with, and as well they have acts, they, they have the same presentation and have we work really closely with to improve consistency of messaging. So uh, if you or a member organization um, uh, would be feel more comfortable talking to somebody from the BCAFC. Um, I can help put you in touch with somebody there, or you can uh, go to their website and find uh, Ivy Sean see she's the, the person who leads the Gaming Grants program at the BC Association of Aboriginal Friendship Centers. Um, and their mandate is similar to the BCACG, uh, except that obviously it's um, designed to provide assistance to Aboriginal not-for-profits. Uh, so that's the only real difference between those organizations. So um, for, for people who aren't familiar with the program, the, the, the government, the BC government collects gambling revenue uh, every year, and a certain portion of that is allocated to the Community Gaming Grants Program uh, to provide funding to not-for-profits across the province that are, that are providing uh, you know, beneficial uh, programming within their communities. Um, as, I, as I stated before, this branch is now located with the Ministry of Community, Sport, and cultural development. Um, and just to give you an idea of the kind of um, workload that we received, so our branch processes, la well, last year we processed about 6,500 applications. Um, and we managed about 5,000 emails. And we distributed $135 million to not-for-profits. Uh, and that's the funding level that this program has been at for the last five years, is 135. Uh, some of you might have noticed in the last month that our minister announced a funding increase of $5 million to this program, um, which will be allocated specifically to capital grants. Uh, so we'll be opening up a new sector later this year for capital projects, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, but the main point here is that we have been funded at 135, and that, and that will be 140 moving forward. This slide um, is designed just to give you an idea of what our branch looks like. Um, so we have an ex executive director, uh, two administrative assistants, a project support person who's in green because um, she's actually not unique to the branch. She's a ministry resource that other branches can utilize as well. And then we have our director of grants uh, who leads up our grants team, which is really what our whole branch is set up to do, right, is to process community gaming grants. And the other functions within in the branch are designed to provide support to our grant analysts. Uh, so we have two team leaders um, beneath our director of grants and 12 grant analysts. 
Uh, and on the other side, we have myself, the manager of community outreach, and I have a policy analyst working with me. Um, and I mentioned before, I talked about the fact that my position was created to be a contact point uh, at the branch. It's also um, there to be um, providing a education and outreach services such as this video conference. Uh, so making sure organizations are informed and prepared to submit their community gaming grant application. Uh, and then the other side of it is policy. So uh, we are intending to improve the program on an every every year. So on an annual basis, we're, we're constantly reviewing and thinking about uh, potential policy changes that would improve the program. So if you have uh, recommendations or advice, uh, things you would like to see changed, you're more than welcome to contact me and, and make me aware of that. And we'll certainly take it into consideration uh, when we are looking at uh, policy direction of, of the program. So the available funding um, for this program, we have three levels. So at, at a local, at a, Local level organizations are um, eligible to apply for up to $100,000 a year, and regional and provincial organizations um, can apply up to $225,000 and $250,000 um, $250, per year. Um, we often get questions about, you know, how do we how do we become recognized as a regional or provincial organization? Um, if you look at the new guidelines in Appendix One, we've made an effort to explain the the criteria that we look at. Um, things that we look at are, th are uh, things like uh, the geographic area that your program serves, uh, the population, the size of the population that your programs uh, serve. The, uh, we look at it, is there a similar organization providing the same or a similar service in, in the same region? And if there is, then it's unlikely that we would provide uh, an organization with regional or provincial de designation. So those are some of the things we look at. Um, if, if, if you are an organization that thinks that you um, should be being funded at a regional or provincial level, I would encourage you to contact me. It's, it's something that we should probably talk about um, offline just to, because it's not something that the analysts will, will, will hand out um, very easily. It, it, is, it is something that we, that we take very seriously. So if you are um, serious about that, please give me a call and we can talk it through. Uh, the other point I wanted to highlight on this slide is that for local level organizations, you can apply up to 100,000, or for, for really for all the organizations, just because the threshold is, a, is 100,000, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that's what you should apply for. This, this program is always looking backwards um, at what you have done in the past. So we're, we're looking at your previous fiscal year, uh, and that's what we're interested in funding, is, is what you've already been able to do. Um, so if your program costs $20,000 to deliver, um, it doesn't make sense to request $100,000 from, from the Gaming Grants program. Um, it, if you do do that, and, and a lot of organizations do, I think there is a myth out there from a lot of people that you, know, you need to apply for double uh, the, the amount that you actually need, and, and I, can, I can guarantee you that's not true. In fact, if you are submitting applications asking for 100,000 when your program actually only costs 30,000 or 40,000, um, it's kind of an indication to the analyst that you haven't really thought this application through, and um, it, it could end up hurting you. So we would ask that you apply for what you need, and, and, and that is partly based on um, the size and scope of your program last year. So if your program, it's what your program cost in your previous fiscal year. Um, I think uh, one thing that I forgot to mention is that this, this program is different than um, other grant programs in the sense that it's not a competitively adjudicated program. So we, we don't actually rank or compare applications. Um, we, um, we simply ask that organizations uh, demonstrate that they meet the eligibility criteria, which are outlined in the guidelines. Uh, and if you can meet those eligibility criteria, then you're going to receive uh, some level of grant funding. So just to give you an example um, or some context, last any, any on a given year, uh, roughly 90% of applicants receive a gaming grant. So it's an indication that a large, huge percentage of organizations are, are receiving a gaming grant that apply. You just have to be able to, to meet the eligibility criteria. And that's, that's really what this, these next 
uh, slides are about. The, there are three kind of pillars of eligibility, and those would be organization, program, and financial. And we're going to go through each of those really carefully um, because it, this is kind of the most important part of the, the presentation, I would say, is that um, you need to be able to demonstrate that you meet these, these, these key criteria. So looking at the organization, um, what we're looking for, uh, you have to demonstrate that you're a not-for-profit. Um, you have to have double the, or more than double the number of voting members to board members. So you have to have a, a broadly based in um, membership and open membership. Um, your board members must be democratically chosen. Um, two, and uh, two th at least two-thirds of them have to reside in the province, and they can't be, um, they have to be volunteers who don't receive any monetary remuneration uh, for their duties. Those are, the, those are the key things that we look at at the organization level. And we do ask you to submit a number of documents to, to back, back this stuff up. So we'll, we'll ask to see your constitution and bylaws. Um, we'll want to see a list of your board of directors, um, including their names and addresses, um, we'll ask to see your most recent annual general meeting minutes, and the, the analysts will actually look through your, your, your most recent AGM minutes to make sure there was a democratic process to electing your board of directors. So make sure that that information is included in there. The, um, there are a number of organizations that would be ineligible to apply. Um, so those would be things like governments, um, any hospital or medical facility, provincial facilities like libraries. Um, and there is a longer list that are outlined in, in Section 3.2 of the guidelines. So if you, I, I don't think anyone on this call should, should fall into that uh, category, but if you're interested, have a look at 3.2, and you'll see um, an extensive list of organizations that, that would, wouldn't meet the eligibility criteria. We, um, so we accept... Uh, applications in six sectors. I think everyone on this call would, would fall within the sports sector. Um, so uh, the, the sports sector is open. Um, each of these kind of has a different um, application intake period, and I'm going to go through that a bit later in the presentation. Uh, but just for everyone's reference, sport is open February 1st to May, uh, May 31st. Um, and that some of the things we get into in this slide probably aren't necessary to go through with this group. Everyone should be within sport. Um, so I think I'll just move on to the next, the next slide. I'll skip this one too. There, there shouldn't be any PACs or DPACs or service clubs on this call. If there are, uh, you can speak up. Okay. So the next... After we look at your organization to make sure it meets the eligibility criteria, then, then the next thing we look at is your program. Um, so you have to demonstrate that your program has um, been in existence for at least 12 months. Uh, so we don't fund new ideas or opportunities. Um, and that's something that's different from other grant programs too. A lot of times people are used to writing grants, um, talking about what they would do with the money if they, if they had it. And, and what we're, this program is set up to do is to provide funding for what, you've are, what you're already doing. Um, so we, it needs to be an existing program, at least 12 months. It needs to provide a clear community benefit. And in the next slide, I'm going to talk about the program description in detail. So I'm just going to go through this quickly right now, but we will talk about the program description. Um, your program needs to be accessible and inclusive, so it needs to be open wherever possible. Um, and your program... Uh, needs to be sustainable. And, and for our purposes, I know uh, sustainability is a word that, that gets used a lot, but for us at, in, in our branch, what we're talking about is community support. So we want to see that your program has a strong level of community support. Uh, we also fund special events, provided that they occur on a regular basis. Uh, for example, like an annual event uh, we provide funding for. And if you are provide, if you are uh, requesting funding for an event, you, that would be your program. So your, um, you know, like a sports event that, that happened every July, you would apply for for funding for that as a program. Um, we also su um, supply funding for scholarships and bursaries, provided that your organization has within its mandate um, 
the purpose to distribute scholarships and bursaries? Um, I don't, I'm not sure, there might be some organizations on this call that, that fall within that category. And the key thing to remember here is that if you are applying for uh, this category that you, the, the grant funds have to be distributed directly to the student uh, for education at a post-secondary institution, an accredited post-secondary institution. Um, and we also provide funding for minor capital projects. So these are projects that are, would cost, their total cost would be less than $20,000. Um, uh, so, if and and they have to actually also be um, essential to the direct delivery of your program. Um, so if you if you needed uh, something like new flooring that was going to cost fifteen thousand dollars and it was essential to the direct delivery of your approved program, if you were say like um, I don't know like a, a gym facility of some kind. Um, you could apply for $15,000 to cover the floors in addition to the program um, money that you've always requested. Um, you would have to highlight that in your, in your application. I would recommend that you in, include a cover letter if you're requesting money for a minor capital project. And just to be clear, the total cost of the, minor, of the project has to be less than $20,000. You, you couldn't have a project that costs $60,000, but you only wanted twenty dollars from gaming. It's the total cost of the project that is less than $20,000. Um, and I would also add here, just to manage expectations, that just because you apply for a minor capital project, um, it doesn't mean that you would be approved. It just means that you're eligible to apply, and it's, a, it's incumbent upon you to make a really strong case for why um, the funding for that project is essential to the continuing direct delivery of, of your approved program. Um, and I mentioned before that our minister recently announced a new sector for, for the Community Gaming Grants Program. Um, so I'll talk about that here. So la last, last month, um, uh, it was announced that we'll have $5 million for a capital project sector. And we've been working since then on putting together the policy parameters for that, um, for that sector. And uh, we will be announcing next week, we'll be putting out an information bulletin with um, more information about that. So the intake period, uh, some of the criteria that we'll be looking for. Um, so keep an eye out for that. If you, if you are an organization that has been uh, thinking for a long time about applying for some kind of a major capital project, such as a new facility, or you need a new roof, um, or some, some major piece of equipment, uh, you might you might be eligible to apply for for this uh, in this new sector, and and that would be in addition to your your regular um, sports programming that you would apply for. Um, so I, I imagine there's probably some questions about that, and I can answer that fall at the end of the presentation. So I I wanted to talk about program description. This is a really important part of the application. Um, this is where when you get to the online application, it says, please describe, um, please provide a description of your program. And you, just so, so everyone is clear, you don't actually have to fill in that uh, box in the online application. Um, you can write out your program description ahead of time and attach it as a PDF or Microsoft Word document. Um, and, and that makes it easier for you as, as the applicant. Um, you, you're not limited by the four 4,000 or 40,000 characters um, that you are when you do the online application. Um, you can, you can, your program description can be as many characters as you like, although we would like you to keep them like concise and direct. What the analyst is really looking for is, is what you do, how you do it, and, and how often. Um, I would recommend you use headings, and so we'd like to see a community benefit heading, and here you would talk about um, the the benefit that your program has in the community uh, in which you operate. So, um, you know, what are the issues in your community and how your program addresses those issues? And the best way to back that up is with numbers and statistics. So most organizations here um, would be talking about the number of, of players or participants or members within their sporting organization. Um, you know, talk about uh, the number of hours that um, programming is, is available, um, 
you know, how many, if you're doing things like workshops or outreach, you know, how, how, how often those are conducted, how many workshops, how many sporting events were done. Um, if you can use, if you have numbers and statistics, it's a great way to, back, to demonstrate your, your community benefit. Um, the next heading would be accessibility and inclusiveness. So here we just want to see that your program is open uh, and inclusive, that it's not restricted to your membership. Um, that it's not exclusive, like it's not, it doesn't, it's not cost prohibitive for some people, um, that it doesn't discriminate based on things like race or, or gender or ethnicity. Um, the, the third heading that we'd like to see is sustainability. And again, this is where we want to see community support. So this is where you would highlight any in-kind, so any, any volunteer labor that you have, any donated materials or services that people in your community are providing. Um, if you have corporate sponsorship, you would highlight it here. If you've, if you've done any successful fundraising events, highlight that. If you have uh, letters of support from leaders in your community or from parents of, of children in your program, um, feel free to attach those. You don't have to attach a ton of, a ton of letters. Um, we're just looking you know, for one to three letters, and it's just a kind of a, a good way to back up the fact that you really do have strong community support. Um, and you can attach those letters anywhere in the document where you see, or anywhere in the online application where it says attach. You can attach supplemental documents such as letters of reference or, or cover letters. Um, one other thing to cover here, just following the program description, you'll see a box that says describe in detail how grant funds will be used. Um, and this is where we want to see a clear breakdown of, of what you intend to spend the money on um, that, you, that you're asking for. So. I would recommend, you know, if, if rather than applying for, um, you know, $100,000, that you apply for whatever your program cost actually is. If it's if it's $96,000 and 80, 8880, $96,880, and then back up in this box um, exactly what those expenses, exactly what those funds will be used for, and and that's just an, a clear indication to the analyst that you've actually thought through. Um, your application and you're not just asking for $100,000 because it's the max, that it actually, you actually have um, designated sources for the, for the funding that you're requesting. Um, there are some programs that are ineligible. Um, they're, they're all outlined in the guidelines of Section 4.4. So I'm just going to highlight three here because they're the most common. Um, so we don't provide funding for any programs that provide financial assistance to individuals. Um, so that would be things like, you know, ca checks or, or um, cash or, or grocery cards for people. Um, we don't provide professional development or vocational training. Um, and another big one is, is contracts. So we don't provide funding for programs that are already contracted. So if you have a, an agree like a funding agreement with another um, government entity or any entity where you have a specific contract, like a service agreement where you have agreed to deliver a certain set of services for a set amount of money, you can't come to gaming and ask uh, for money to supplement that, that program um, just because we can't uh, get involved in, in, those, in, in something that's already been contracted. There, there are other uh, examples, and they're all listed within Section 4.4. So if you're, if you're curious or you're a bit concerned, have a look at the guidelines, uh, and there's a long list of what we, we would deem ineligible programs. So after looking at the organization and uh, program eligibility, the analysts will look at your financials. And there's um, some, a few things that, that are key here. So the first thing is you have to have a gaming bank account. So if you're a first-time applicant and you've never done this before, you, you'll have to open up a gaming bank account. And any bank or credit union can help, help you with that. It's quite easy. Um, you'll have to have gaming bank account checks. Uh, and we'll ask you to include a void check with your application. Um, and this is because it's the only way we can verify that you actually have a gaming bank account. And it's, it's where your money will be deposited if, if and when you get the grant. Um, some organizations have, have said, you know, well, we really don't want to have to pay for the checks. Is there anything else we can do? Um, we would like you to have checks and use them uh, to spend, you know, for the cost of your program. 
But if, if, you're, if you really don't want to get checked, you can include a void a counter check with your application. Um, but deposit slips won't, won't cut it. That's not enough. We need to see an actual uh, void counter check or a void gaming bank account check with your application. Um, you can't have earned more than $250,000 in the past 12 months through licensed gaming activities. Um, that's pretty hard to achieve, but there are some organizations that do that. Um, and then the next two uh, points are really important. There's the 75% rule and the 50% rule. And I'm going to go through each of those individually. So the 75% rule um, basically holds that we will only allow funding from federal uh, and provincial government sources to, to amount to 75% of the, the program cost. So and we're looking here at the total program cost. Um, and the, you can make up that other 25% uh, through a number of ways. So you can make that up with in-kind, um, so volunteer labor. So this is where if you have uh, people that are volunteering their time to the delivery of your program, you want to keep track of that. And you can value those hours at up to $20 an hour. Um, and you want to, well, we, we say up to $20 an hour because um, you just want to keep in mind as an organization that if you do have paid staff uh, and you're paying them at a lower rate than what you're valuing your volunteer hours at, it, it could create problems for you. Um, so just keep that in mind. You can value your volunteer hour, labor up to $20 an hour, but um, it's up to you. Um, and then you can include, that can, that can be your other 25%. Your other 25% can also come from, um, you know, municipal grants or, or fundraising that you do, corporate sponsorship. It's up to you. Uh, the reason that we have this rule is because, one, we don't want organizations to have an over-dependence on, on funding. And uh, we also want to see that you have some, some level of community support for the programs that you're providing. So if you can demonstrate to us that you can come up with 25% of your program cost, that's an indication that you have at least some level of, of support in your community. The, um, the next uh, rule that I wanted to go through is the 50% rule. So this is, this is a really important part. Um, this is where we, what we look at is, uh, or what the rule is, is that you can't have more than 50% of your previous fiscal year's operating expenses on hand. Um, and what we mean by this is say your program costs $10,000 to deliver, or sorry, this is at the organization level, just to be clear. So say your organization uh, cost $10,000 to run, and at the end of your fiscal year, um, you still had uh, $7,000 in your bank account. We would look at that and say, well, this organization doesn't really have as much financial need as an organization that has, you know, $0 in its bank account or even $4,000. So we've come up with this formula, and we've capped it at 50%. So you can have up, what we're saying is you can have up to 40, you know, $4,900, $5,000 in your bank account, but no more than that. Um, and the reason we've capped it there is because we realize that a lot of organizations like to have a contingency fund on hand, you know, that makes sense uh, from, from a financial st standpoint of view to, to have some uh, money on hand in case of an emergency or, or some kind of unexpected uh, need. Um, and that's fine, it just can't exceed 50% of your previous year's operating expenses. Um, so this formula that's here on the slide, um, just to be clear, no one is, is obligated to do this uh, formula as part of your application. It's just up here for transparency sake. So it's up here to, um, to make sure you understand what we're doing when we're looking at your organization financials. So what we do is we take your current cash assets and investments, and we minus like we take out any gaming funds, so any gaming grant that you got, we don't hold those against you. Any current liabilities we take out. Um, any internally restricted funds, and this is a key point. So if you have um, an internally restricted fund for, say, a capital project, like a new roof or something, that's fine, but you need to make sure that with your organization financials, you're including notes. Um, and in the note, for that fund, we would want to see the date that those funds were restricted, um, the purpose for which they were restricted, and the minute from the meeting 
um, where your board voted to restrict those funds and a date at which you expend, expect to disperse those funds. Um, same thing with externally restricted funds. So if you, if you have received a donation from somebody or a grant that is from another organization that is clearly tied to some future expense, um, you can, those can be noted as externally restricted funds, but again, we need to see the notes in, with your organization financials indicating the date uh, from who they were restricted and, and when you expect to spend them and its purpose. Um, you might get asked uh, by an analyst that's reviewing your application to see a letter or some kind of uh, evidence that those funds actually have been externally restricted. Um, and and you, you're, that shouldn't be, um, please don't consider that a uh, you know, personal offense or by any means, it's just the analyst doing their due diligence. So then we take that and we divide it by your actual operating expenses from your previous fiscal year. Uh, we multiply it by 100 to give us a percentage and that's, and that's what we're looking at with the 50% rule. Um, again, just as with the organization and program, there are documents at the financial level that we ask to see to back up um, that you meet the criteria. So at the organization level, we want to see a balance sheet for the previous fiscal year. Uh, we want to see revenue and expense statements for the previous fiscal year. And again, all those notes, if you have internally or externally restricted funds. Um, and we'd like to see your current fiscal year and next fiscal year budget. I've included here the gaming account summary report. Um, that's not something that, um, that, that you have to um, submit with your application. It is something that you are required as an organization to provide within 90 days of your fiscal year end. Um, but I highlighted here because we won't actually process your application until we've received that report. So it's really important that people get those in and that they're done properly. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about the gaming account summary report in a minute. At the program level, and this is a key uh, nuance to the program or to this the application is that um, at the, for each program that you're applying, we want to see a different set of financials. Um, so we want to see revenue and expense statements for the previous fiscal year. Um, we want to see an in-kind summary report if claimed. So if you've claimed volunteer labor, at $20 an hour. Um, you can download uh, like a, an example in-kind summary report from our website. It's really easy to fill out and you would attach that to your application anywhere where you see the attach button in the online application. Um, and at the program level, we also want to see a budget for the current fiscal year and the next fiscal year. Um, so again, if you have three programs that you're applying for funding for, we want to see your organization level financials, but then we'll also want to three, see three sets of program financials. Sometimes I think our organizations have a hard time understanding that. Just looking at the time, um, I'm probably going to go through these next slides um, uh, rather quickly. So there are two types of application forms you can use. There's a regular and a short. First time applicants uh, need to do the regular, and once you've done the regular application for two years in a row, you can do a short application. The short application is less onerous. You don't have to provide as much information. Um, it is quite a bit easier. Now, the, the, the key thing to remember is if you, the only way you would do a short form is if you were asking for the same program and the same amount of money that you received in your previous year. If you are asking for more money than you received last year, you would need to do the regular application. Um, that's a really common thing that happens as organizations ask uh, for more money than they received last year, but they fill out the short, and then they contact us asking why didn't they get, um, why, why aren't they receiving more money than, than, than what they're being given. Um, well, the, part of the reason is, is that you're doing the short application. So you need to, if you're asking for more money than what you got last year, you need to do the regular. Um, another reason that you wouldn't do the short is if um, you received your, your grant uh, as a result of a reconsideration. And I'll talk briefly about that in a second. Um, and uh, if, if the analyst in their letter indicated that you, would, you should do the regular application next year, then you, then you shouldn't do the short, you should do the regular. 
that here? Here um, we just highlight what the intake period is again. For sport, it's open February 1st to May 31st. Um, please submit a complete application. So use the pre-application checklist. The pre-application checklists are available on our website. There's a different one for a regular and a short application. Um, it's a really good idea to, to use those because if you don't have a complete application, um, your, your, your grant is actually ineligible. Like it, it, if it's not complete, we don't, we don't process it. Um, reconsiderations. So if you do feel as an organization that an error has been made in processing your application, you can apply to the Gaming Grants Branch for a reconsideration. Um, you have to make that written request within 30 days of your grant denial or approval letter. Um, and once it's received back by us, the executive director uh, will personally review that and uh, either vary or uphold the original decision. Again, the reconsideration is only in cases where you think an error has been made. It's not an opportunity to provide new information uh, or supplement, uh, provide supplemental documents that weren't included with your original application. In this slide, we just um, talk about the grant life cycle. I'm not, I'm not going to go through it. Um, just to highlight um, that we do have a number of, of levels of quality assurance that the, your, your application goes through. Um, a lot of, we ha I have been asked in the past, you know, like, is anyone actually reading our application? And the answer is um, yes, that uh, our analysts uh, take, their job, <laughs> take their job very seriously. They are, they are going through the applications uh, individually, and they do go through. Um, if an analyst makes a decision, it goes to uh, their team lead who reviews that application in depth, and either varies or or sends it up, or sends it sends it up to our director for a second round of uh, quality assurance, and then it goes up to our executive director for a third round of quality assurance. So each each application is reviewed in depth. This slide is um, set up just to ensure that everyone understands that once you receive a grant, you are accountable for those funds you receive. So um, you, you have to spend the funds um, to cover costs essential to the direct delivery of your approved program. Um, those are outlined in Section 7.1. So if you're at all ever concerned about, you know, this is really an eligible expense, refer to the guidelines. And if it's not clear, feel free to contact me or somebody else at the branch uh, to get an answer. Um, another thing, you are requ required to um, disperse funds within 12 months. So from the date that you receive them, you have 12 months uh, to spend them, regardless of your fiscal. You don't have to spend them in your fiscal, but they do have to be spent within 12 months of receiving them. Uh, again, this, this slide is uh, about accountability. There are a number of conditions that you, as, a, as an app, as a grant recipient, are um, expected to, to follow. Uh, they're all outlined in Section 8.1 of the guidelines. The most important, or one of the most important ones, is definitely the Gaming Account Summary Report. This is the only tool that we have to ensure that organizations are spending the money that they're being given on eligible expenses. Um, so it's really important that everyone fills those out and gets those in. Um, and just to be clear, we want to see line-by-line -line expense items from your gaming account um, out to cover the costs directly associated with your with your program. So it's it's not okay to include like you know September eighth twenty thousand dollars to cover expenses of program X. We want to see you know three thousand and eight hundred and fifty three dollars September eighth to cover uh, wages of coach uh, as part of program X. So we want to see detail, a lot of detail within the, the gaming account summary report. And you can see an example of a, of a filled out gaming account summary report on our, on our website. So have a look up there if you're curious about that. And finally, I'll just end it with some tips and advice. So be sure to read the guidelines. Um, make sure to use the pre-application checklist. This is a good one. Uh, I would recommend saving all of your required documents, like all your supplemental documents, in a folder somewhere on your computer uh, before you start the online application so that you have everything there. So you've got your constitution and bylaws, your listed board of directors, you know, all your financials, your program description. It's all, it's all there and uh, in, in titled so that you can just attach it as you're filling out your online application. Um, 
This is another really good one. Be sure to read your previous year's grant approval or denial letter. Um, and so if you've received a letter last year, you may have noticed that the analyst has made um, some points um, about compliance, uh, or you, in some cases even made a reference like this will be the last year that you will receive funding if you do not address uh, these issues to come into compliance. Um, so make sure you read your, your letter. Um, a lot of organizations receive their money and they don't actually read that letter and then they apply the next year and they're surprised when they, when they don't receive a grant or receive significantly less funding than what they received the year before. Um, so make sure to read those letters. If you did get a letter like that, um, I would encourage you to include a cover letter with your application. Um, and you can attach that, again, anywhere in the online application. And in that cover letter, you would just uh, highlight something simple like, Dear Analyst, thank you for the letter dated, you know, April 2016. In regards to point number one, um, we have taken these steps to come into compliance or to address that issue. And you would do that for each point that the analyst highlighted. And that's just an indication uh, to the analyst right off the bat that you've, that you've read your letter from last year and that you've taken steps to address any issues that were outlined. Um, there are financial uh, statements uh, templates available up online that, that you uh, can follow or organizations uh, that are members within your, your larger PSOs um, that people can follow. They don't have to. You're not obligated to use those, but it, it is a good resource uh, for people that aren't really comfortable or, or have the you know, uh, capacity to, to deal with it and haven't done a lot of accounting work or something like that. Um, apply early in the intake period. This is a, this is a good point. Uh, applications are processed as they are received, so the sooner you apply, the sooner you'll hear from us. We don't wait until the last day of the application intake period to start processing. Um, something like, you know, a huge percentage of organizations apply on the last week and, and, and even more on the last day of the intake period, um, which means that our analysts are um, really busy from the last day until the of the application, processing applications, trying to get them out on time. Um, so it's, it benefits you to get your application in early. It means that you'll hear from us earlier. It also means that the analyst uh, will have more time, most likely, to contact you if there is something missing or they're not clear about something than if you handed it in on the last day. So with that, um, I'll open it up to the floor for question and answer. We got, you know, 15. I'm, I'm available for as long as people, people require. require. But Go ahead. What do you have? Okay, okay so, so maybe we'll start. Um, sorry, guys, it's Jessica from VS4. We'll start with the questions that are coming in um, in the chat box. So we've got um, one. I'll start with this first one. Because of the 75% rule that organizations should then not apply for the full amount of a program, but 75% of the full amount, is that right, Trevor? Yeah, so if your program um, costs $10,000, we'll only fund, we'll only accept funding from provincial or federal government um, up to 7,500 uh, 75 or 75% of that program. Um, but you can make up that other 25% through in-kind or, or other, or other um, examples, uh, like corporate sponsorship or fundraising. So it's, I don't want to say that you shouldn't, you should apply for what, what you think you're, what you think you need, um, but we will look at what your revenue is for that program, and and we will only allow gov like provincial federal government to cover seventy five percent of that cost. Brian, does, does that, that make help sense? you? Yep, I think that's a good one. Okay, so we'll move on to the next one. Um, if someone is applying for the same program funding but adding a minor capital project, could they use the short form application? No. No, if you're, if you're applying for a minor capital project, you would use the regular application because you're asking so for more money than, than what you received in the last year. Okay, so the capital project um, becomes a change and then they'd need to go through the long form? Yes. Okay. Okay, that's all we have in the chat box right now. Um, 
you guys are welcome to chime in on the phone if you want to just take yourselves off mute. Oh, I've got two more, sorry. Um, so if the amount requested is less than the previous year, would the long form be required? Um, that's a good question. I would... Is it, it, it would depend if it was the same program. It's almost a question so let's that I would assume if it's the same program, but the same same program, but less funding. Yeah, I'm going to say that the regular application would need to be provided, but I would be open to that person just writing me, and that's something I can clarify um, with my grants team because I, I don't think I've ever heard had that question before. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Um, next one would be, uh, can a director earn an honorarium if they support a role like coaching? So they're a, a director of the organization as well as a volunteer coach for the organization. Yeah, so if you're a volunteer, uh, then you shouldn't be receiving any, any, any kind of, like, gaming ground funding shouldn't be used to provide um, money to that person, like a volunteer is uh, donating their time to provide a service, um, knowing that they wouldn't be receiving any kind of honorarium. Okay, so could Does a director uh, also be a coach that receives an honorarium? Like, is it, do you mean like a board of director or a paid staff? Yeah, a board of director. I, I assume that the board of, yeah, like a board of director could be a coach um, and receive uh, funding through through the organization, I suppose. Um, but it wouldn't be, we don't provide, gaming grant funding should not be used to, to pay, a, you know, volunteer coaches honorariums. Okay. I think that clarifies it. Um, and then lastly, can we just reiterate the intake periods for the year? For sport, it's uh, February 1st to May 31st. Yep. So uh, any other questions? Um, Trevor's given us lots of information. Um, we will, we have recorded the webinar, so we will get it posted up on our resources page within the next couple days. Um, the presentation and the audio will be there. Um, lots of information from Trevor on who to contact, who to contact for help, um, you know, specific email addresses for the Gaming Grants branch, um, as well as some other organizations that could help you guys. So. Um, I'll leave it open again if you've got a few more questions. Um, otherwise, we will close off. Thank you very much, Trevor, for doing, um, providing the information for us. Uh, quite helpful um, and certainly helpful to have it accessible that we, uh, organizations can go back and take a look um, at their convenience. So um, thank you for that. Thank you to all of you guys um, for joining us. Hopefully that was helpful for you. Um, and we'll uh, take it from there. Great. Well, thank, thank you, Jessica, for setting up. And, yeah, I would just reiterate uh, to everyone on the line that you're more than welcome to contact me if you have further questions. I'd be happy to help. Excellent. Thanks, guys.